Hello and welcome to the special features section of the Series 1 box set DVD. We've managed to find some bits and pieces that didn't make it to air, a vintage Frank Woodley performance from the pilot episode that should have made it to air, and a series of highlight categories that we collected as we went along. There's also a short behind-the-scenes documentary that was made during the final show, and in the spirit of thank God you're here, you'll be asked to do the commentary. No, not really, only joking. You may be able to fill us in a bit. We did our here. best to ask questions we were sure were going to outwit the performers, but we loved it best when, with half a second's thought, they managed to outwit the question. Like when Angus found himself as a surgeon and was asked a question only a decade of study could answer. Maybe we should get on with the procedure. How do you want to approach this, Doctor? Traditionally. <laughs> Sean McAuliffe took a different path after finding himself as a kids' show co-host. He not only deflected his responsibilities as host, but also managed to force them onto a bear. Yes. I think it might be road safety Sam, and I think he's got a few messages for us. All right, now, road safety Sam, would you like to spend at least oh, 10 or 15 minutes explaining the road safety messages? <laughs> Akmal Sali was another who was expected to demonstrate their expertise on a subject for which they possessed complete ignorance. In fact, he probably got the toughest question for the whole series and still managed to sidestep. What are your views on valerian extract in the treatment of myocardiac arrhythmia? Well, I, I have very... Uh, I'm glad you asked, Gareth. <laughs> because my views are well known. They're published in the journal. If you've read the journal, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm not going to even answer that. It's just idiot. <laughs> Glenn Robbins chose a completely different technique as the husband of a suspicious wife. He proved the old adage, when you've got explaining to do, distract. Who was that? <laughs> I think I smell smoke. <laughs> Julia Zamiro outwitted the writing team without using words. She had a lot of explaining to do and only a second to do it. What the hell has happened here? Oh. Same goes for Josh Lawson, who had just met his internet date. He soon discovered he'd passed himself off as French. And then he discovered he was married to someone else. Two-faced sleazebag? Uh, <laughs> What's going on? Perhaps the cleanest version of the split-second sidestep came from Bob Franklin. Any other ideas? Yes, he'll have one for sure. <laughs> Later in the series, Sean couldn't possibly have an answer to a question and still managed to cover his tracks. The ambassador uh, and myself doubt you even know where our country is. Well, I can only be affronted, sir. I take umbrage <laughs> at that suggestion. In fact, I am going to leave. No. <laughs> And finally, back to Angus, who found himself a POW in charge of an escape plan that not even the writers could explain. Surely this time we'd tripped him up. Beaver, would you like to talk us through your plan for getting out of here? Yes. Is there anything you don't understand? <laughs> Bridget for you. As the series progressed, admiration from everyone behind the show developed for another skill in our performers. When stuck in a corner with no obvious way out, they managed to call on a strange little-known fact to cover their tracks. Uh, this one was the, um, the, the dolphin pad, which we <laughs> clearly mark H, because <laughs> dolphins, their high intelligent being, had their own alphabet. They understand D is an H. So <laughs> Fifi didn't have to come up with a fact so much as a quote. Describe how a gentleman is similar to a noble steed. <laughs> Mr Blake, I think you would find that a, a gentleman is very much like a steed in that you can... You can... <laughs> yes, you dear, can yes, dear? pat him. <laughs> I think when Frank walked out of makeup, he must have known there was every chance he'd be required to show wisdom where previously there was only ignorance. Don't try to eat a stone. You... it'll hurt. <laughs> Akmar managed to make his fact sound like an old truism. Cures don't happen overnight, people. <laughs> we live in a very impatient society. They want bang, bang, bang. This takes about seven years to work. <laughs> 
After an intergalactic trip to another planet, fellow crew members naturally expected their captain to be full bottle on the inhabitants. The men are lucky enough to carry 14 uh, sexual organs, <laughs> all at different weights and sizes, all in different parts of the body. You know, crazy talk. Here, 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 here and here, and a couple there and there. And it's party time down there. <laughs> Alan not only had to come up with an explanation, he had to make it sound like one from a politician. I, I don't think you can truly understand poverty until you've been incredibly rich. <laughs> Josh Lawson found himself in a group of dog handlers. He also found himself in possession of expert knowledge shortly thereafter. Right. Number one rule, <laughs> dog obedience. <laughs> don't touch their heads. Oh, my God. Bob Franklin, as a South American rebel leader, didn't just have to come up with a fact, but rather a whole manifesto. Comrade, please, remind us of your three-point manifesto. Ah. All men are... All men are... expecting too much. <laughs> the price of freedom is... Uh, something we can all afford, I think, if, uh, <laughs> if we put our minds to it, yes? Yes, yes. It is. And it is better to die than to... To, um, to just uh, get by, isn't it, really? Akmal <laughs> managed to find a way to dispute what had previously been a well-known fact. I mean, I know setting a dog on fire may seem cruel. <laughs> but perhaps the best situation-saving explanation came from Kate Langbrook. In 2,000 years, nobody's been able to explain exactly why the pyramids were built. But Kate managed the task in about three seconds. Every man needs a project. <laughs> and that is why we are building the pyramids. <laughs> One, two, three, <clears throat> four. We are the wibbly wobbly, wibbly wobbly, the wibbly wobbly. There was nothing the creators of the show loved more than forcing these talented performers to invent slogans and catchphrases at extremely short notice. In this case, Fifi was battling her newfound role as head of Biotronics when, of course, she was asked for their famous slogan. If you can do it, you can! <laughs> Matthew Newton was cleverly passing himself off as the creator of an ad campaign for a new drink. And what groovy campaign doesn't have a groovy slogan? Big idiots not good ever. In Akmal's case, the advertorial for his slightly questionable health products line naturally had to come with a disclaimer. Take these products only as directed, and if problems persist... Keep taking them. <laughs> Glenn learned that catchphrases are far from a modern invention and that being stuck somewhere in the 9th century was no protection. It slices. <laughs> Alan Bro had double trouble. Let's uh, have a look at your workplace reforms. We have here uh, banning workers from taking a toilet break between the hours of nine and five. <laughs> well, uh, when we ran for office, one of our slogans was, just hold on, you bastards. And as Minister for Tourism, he naturally would know what the revamped ad campaign was all about. Uh, you've been highly critical of the recent tourist campaign, Where the Bloody Hell Are You? You say you've come up with a much better slogan. <laughs> My new slogan, and um, imagine it, it's very much like the original campaign. Yes. Um, just imagine uh, beautiful beaches and a person standing there and they are wondering where they are and a slogan flashes up. You're in Australia, you bloody idiot. <laughs> Later in the series, Angus found himself as Phil from Aussie Phil's Pies. And have you ever heard of an Aussie pie that doesn't have a catchphrase? Whenever you feel very, very ill, get into the ring with Aussie Boxing Phil! <laughs> And just finally, Hamish Blake didn't so much have a catchphrase, but instead a trademark salute. <laughs> I'm
I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> One other set of clips we collected sounds like a category from the Academy Awards. We called it Best Use of a Prop. There was Matt Newton and a banana. I'm sorry to make a mess, but it's also... <laughs> Sean and a toy rat. And how do they all... <laughs> Santo explained the use of a set of goggles. This one is to put on while I inspect for well, that's bad, the bad art. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I spotted one there. Angus had to explain a gift to a sacked employee. I think this will best sum up the news I have to give you. I think, uh, unfortunately, what he's trying to say is that we're going to have to let you go. What's that supposed to mean? You're not going to go home empty-handed. <laughs> Josh managed to explain a prop not even the writers understood. Well, firstly, you need one of these. <clears throat> OK, so you're going to... This, is, yeah. this you, you're going to have to have just by the dinner table, OK? First things first. <laughs> you get, right? Look right. at him. Who's in control? Who is in control? <laughs> Angus managed to find time to use a whiteboard. So does this mean you and I are through? <laughs> well... <laughs> let's just work that out. Sean managed to give a prop away. Uh, please accept this as a gift from the Ministry <laughs> to you. Josh managed to find time to drink the prop. Yeah, that tribe, all the women. Tell them about that. Oh. What were they called? <laughs> oh, God. They was cold. <laughs> Angus managed to find time to eat the prop. <laughs> and finally, oh, Hamish nice. managed yep. to find time to ask someone else to eat the props. I sent three messages. What kept you? Couldn't find the biscuits. Uh, <laughs> or socks. Um, <laughs> it, uh, but I bought enough for everyone in a way. So <laughs> that's it. Have a half each. We don't have bloopers on the live night. What gets said gets seen. But on the warm up day, the performers sometimes give a less than perfect exhibition of their skills. So, what's your qualification in spelling? <laughs> I, um, I did a, when I was at school, I did a spelling bee. <laughs> Hang on a sec. Mm. You were towing a caravan? Yeah, we're going on holidays after the tour finishes. So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Spelling, when I was at school, I did a spelling bee. <laughs> How would you describe yourself as a driver? Solid. <laughs> big brother shouldn't laugh. <laughs> yeah, well, big brother, you go f yourself, big brother. <laughs> Thank you, Trevor. What's the name of your band? Tommy and the Boys. <laughs> Okay, okay. Are you sure you want to water ski? Are you sure you want me to answer that yeah, question? Kids. Okay, oh, the kids. Um, what you would do is you would attach, this is where you attach it to, that's it. That's what the thing you were talking about. Oh, shit. <laughs> Are you alright? Yeah, no, I'm fine. <laughs> As you can see, the, the, that will hold the weight of it. <laughs> A C A. Got <laughs> <laughs> two sacks. I will be fine. Excuse me. I uh, had a coffee earlier, and uh, I don't normally drink coffee. <laughs> and you spoke with China's president, Mr. Mr. Hungi Gu. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, Name one person involved in this. Me. Good. Yep. 
Unfortunately, Robert Downer did go against uh, Mr Howard's advice and he has loosened his lips somewhat. And is Robert Downer related to Alexander Downer? <laughs> Qualifications? I'm not going to spell him. <laughs> Bereavement leave? What was that for? I thought that my wife was dying. And I wanted to... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not going to spell qualifications. I think I've proved my point. Lots. <laughs> 100 plus the two netballs, maybe the hockey stick. What's the final price? The final price, they'd be... Just check here. C9, 7, 10, mine. <laughs> <laughs> so what's I'm the final price yeah, no. good question Olivia uh, I could go you come on what is that I go you I could I do, I do you 38 38 to 10 I'll round, I do 38 to 10 but I can round that down to 38 200 Let's take it, Dad. It was less before. <laughs> <laughs> OK, qualifications. Q, U, obviously. <laughs> Two seconds. 35? 35? Yeah. Your hand on it? Yeah. All right, Olivia? Thank you, Absolute sir. pleasure to meet you. If you wouldn't mind signing... Um, I have the, just uh, just put your name down on that, we'll... Uh... <laughs> is this the contract? Well, is it an extra? Uh, there'll be a, a, we'll staple some uh, detail to it. <laughs> Q-U-A-L-I, quali, from the Latin, F-I-C, a T I O N S. Yay! God, that's a good. Our performers also have to come up with a lot of names on the warm up day, and we've learned something over the course of the series. If you're making up a name, for some reason, you always look like you're making up a name. Pete Peterson. Mercedes Rule. Michael Markson. Rocky McFly. Mrs. Schlepp. Colin Stubery. Felicity Monk. Audrey Paul. Primrose. Digweems. Crew. I'm Lee Brown. You guys can call me Mr. Lee Brown. My name is Keith. Sam. 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 And Deirdre is your first name? Mm hmm. Deirdre. Jimmy Page. But you can call me Tom. Peter Michael Hewison. Barry Michael Thistle. My name's Trent and I'm your uh, fromage juice. Pete Phillips. John Peterson. Glenn Butcher, That's how are me. you? Mickey Bunyanson. Jason. Steve. Belathai, B E L T H E A H I I. Uh, it's the same material. Sometimes in the act of bluffing, we've noticed a tendency to resort to sounds. Not ones that go to make up words, but just sounds. And to be honest, we're still not sure what all of them were about. Do you want to do that too? See what I mean? Bang, 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 bang. Here's a segment from the original pilot. In this scenario, Frank Woodley soon discovered he was a very successful home builder promoting his designs on a morning TV show. There was a slight complication in that Frank was required to take on a rather ridiculous new bathroom fitting. As you will see, he managed to do away with that complication quite early in the piece and then survive for five minutes in a way that only Frank Woodley can.
with us Managing Director of Eureka Homes, Ken Prendergast. Nice to see you again, Ken. Oh, Samelia. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me back every time I smash shit. <laughs> I can't believe you let me come back on. So, Ken, you're au fait with the building business, obviously. I am, but I'm not very au fait with the word au fait. <laughs> Which is a bit cryptic considering I knew what it meant in order to make that joke. <laughs> Oh, Ken, tell me, what do Aussies look for in a home? They want walls, they want a roof, they want a door, they want windows, they want carpet, they want a lounge room, they want basically a house. <laughs> and, Ken, do Eureka Homes come with any kind of guarantee? We guarantee yes, that our Ken. houses will be livable for at least 15 minutes. <laughs> No, I'm just joking. Care. I'm just joking. A lifetime guarantee. A to, lifetime guarantee to... for Eureka Homes. That's quite extraordinary. Yes, but it's my uncle's life and he only lived for 12 years. <laughs> Ken, tell us, you obviously incorporate elements of feng shui into Eureka Homes. Mm. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> well, we incorporate a little bit of feng shui into our, the design of our houses. And how do you do that, Ken? Oh, you wanted a little bit more than that. <laughs> okay. Just no. for the listeners who might not know okay. what things okay. One is. of the important things, because uh, I need to really demonstrate here, like the, the whole, um, nearly knocked that off then. <laughs> the whole spirit of, of Feng Shui, Samelia, is the movement of energy. <laughs> don't block. We don't want ever. Do you know what I mean? I do. What don't we want? Blocking. And what, how do we demonstrate it? Oh, Samelia. <laughs> we want the movement of energy to be free-flowing and gorgeous. And that's why we don't have a door. <laughs> doors, you know what doors do, don't, don't you, Samelia? Block. Do it with me, Samelia. <laughs> that's it. No. So, no, yeah, I'm Can't coming back. <laughs> <laughs> So, Ken, now that we're getting personal, perhaps you could tell us the relationship between a very good personal friend of yours, Ian Thorpe, and Eureka Holmes. Oh, the Thorpedo. Um, he thinks that our homes mm -hmm. are fully sick. <laughs> and uh, you brought with you a uh, sheet of cork. How does yep. this play an important role in Eureka Homes? Well, the reason why... I the reason why I brought this in, Samelia, is um, is that starting to hurt your hip a bit? Because uh, you, you're digging into me. Uh -huh. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Um, just uh, buying myself a little bit of So in what time. section of your homes do you use the cork? Everywhere. Ken? Everywhere. But so the most exciting and innovative place we use the cork is the window. <laughs> It's been an absolute pleasure to have you mm. on the show today. Thanks. If you could just end with a Eureka Home motto. Eureka Homes, they're the best. Eureka Homes, get rid of the rest. Our guarantee is they'll stay up for at least 15 minutes. <laughs>know the concept now a performer walks into a scenario they know nothing about but what happens in the lead up to that moment what's it like behind the scenes as the show gets put together well we let a camera roam the corridors of the thank god you're here studio during the final show of this series and then made a short cast and cruise eye view of what goes on before during and after the filming of each scene if you haven't seen the last episode it's probably worth watching at first each scenario actually starts many weeks before the live night. It begins as a short script that then is turned into a concept drawing by the art department and ends up as a full set built entirely for that one scene. 
This happens dozens of times. They're able to uh, resemble trees and sneak past Jerry. <laughs> Sometimes the idea begins life as a photo board where all the elements for the set are slowly collected and from that a final concept emerges. Over the entire series, 50 different sets ended up in the studio. It's called the Fun Magnetron. The Fun Magnetron. <laughs> One thing's for sure, by the time we come to shoot the live night, there's ten tons worth of sets and props waiting in the loading bay. On this night, there are six sets involving everything from a federal minister's office to the deck of the Titanic to the set of our new breakfast TV show, Daybreak. Uh, and welcome back to Daybreak. We have a very big hour ahead. You Along the way, we'll go backstage at a circus, visit a 19th century miner's cottage and the boudoir of Cleopatra. Well, you know I am... Cleopatra, Queen of Denial. <laughs> the planning for this goes on for most of the day. The director, lighting team, sound team and staging team go through each of the scenarios working out the best way to film the scenes. It's a strange situation for them too. They know everything except what the performer will actually do and say once they walk through the door. The ensemble actors walk through each scene as well, thinking of different ways to handle different responses. For all the activities throughout the studio complex, it's a strange time for the performers who occupy a side section along with makeup and wardrobe. Since they don't know what's in store and there's no way to prepare, there's little to do except wait and wonder. Have a soft drink, eat some chips, wander around, looking, hoping that no one picks up, you've actually got nothing to do. It's also the thing that binds them together. Not having a clue turns out to be quite relaxing. That strange atmosphere continues into the makeup chair. It's probably the first time in their lives that they've got ready for a performance that they know nothing about. Well, this and your first school dance. Freedom! If the makeup is involved, it's also one of the few times they get a slight clue. I'm thinking I'm some sort of Peter Laylaw type. Um, Eureka Stockade character. But actually, even this can play with your mind. A bushy beard could represent anything from a bush ranger in a previous century to a spaceman without a razor lost somewhere in the future. Or you're actually the lead singer of a bush band, in which case it's going to be a very long night. I wish I knew a little bit more about Australian history. I'd be able to think of something to say about it. The occasional camera roves the back rooms, in this case grabbing a few shots of the cast arriving for that night's opening titles using a spotlight that was used to go roof shooting by the looks of it. <laughs> Behind the studio something unusual is taking place. A chopper pilot is rehearsing his moves with the crew. Some weeks back, a helicopter pad was discovered behind the complex and it's been incorporated into the all-in scenario. One of the cast will find out later that night he's the traffic reporter for a new breakfast TV show and will find out if he's afraid of heights. And wouldn't you know it, a five-year drought decides to break that day, so it's proving to be tricky. Fortunately, for all the noise, it remains a secret. One of the good things about TV studios is that they're completely soundproof. Every effort is made to maintain total secrecy about the scenarios. This affects just about every aspect of the production, even moving the costumes. They're draped in tarpaulins and sheets for the 100 metre transfer from the costume department to the backstage dressing area. Rehearsals take up most of the afternoon. It's easy to wonder how you can rehearse something when you don't know what will be said. So everyone rehearses with a bunch of possibilities in mind. The director and crew and the ensemble of actors walk through the scenario and its likely course with the constant thought of what if this happens or what about that? Or in Frank Woodley's case, what couldn't happen? The direction and camera switching is actually done out of the building. With the number of cameras required, a mobile control room is set up outside the studio in a series of specially designed trucks. Inside, it's like a mini nerve centre. Again, preparations have a double edge to them. There's a constant balancing of what they can and can't predict about that night's show. It's a bit like filming live sport where everyone's forgotten the rules. 
The audience are loaded with about half an hour to go and only minutes after the end of rehearsals. And it's only then that the performers finally make it into the backstage area where I try to make them feel better. You know the stuff. Gee, it's a tough audience tonight. They didn't seem to like it when I said your name, Angus. Good scenario for you, Sean. How much do you know about nuclear physics? You know, that tends to calm them down a little bit. Then... Opening titles roll and the speed of the show seems to take over. They come out for the introductions and then it's straight into the first scenario. The costume change happens backstage. Sean McAuliffe finds out his wardrobe literally with only seconds to go. That's ridiculous. Crazy. You know what I'm wearing? Is this a suit? No, it's a frock. Oh, good. Okay. Then it's a quick chat with me and it's straight through the door. Hi. Thank God you're here, Minister. Well, it's a pleasure. Sean soon discovers he's a federal minister trying to smooth over some nasty incidents with one of our neighbours and, rather disturbingly, really takes to the role. And if there's been any offence at all caused, then I can only blame someone else. <laughs> The time for the various changes is always limited and the costumes vary from the simple to the ridiculous. The first scenario is over in minutes and the set is dismantled immediately. With three already in place, two must be changed during the show. The false walls come off the back, office equipment is struck and the props for Cleopatra's boudoir are moved in. Beginning to think we had to survive the evening without you. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Uh, really? Nice bit of crumpet over there. <laughs> Meanwhile, Angus has found himself on the deck of the Titanic. It turns out he's quite the ladies' man, and he has to turn on the charm at very short notice. And what deck are you on, uh, Mr Higginbottom? The top. <laughs> Always the top. <laughs> eh, that seemed to come a little too naturally for my money. Five minutes later, and it's over. Angus almost looks calm, but all the performers say their minds continue to race long after it ends. What if I'd said that? Maybe I should have said this. And then in 20 minutes, he'll have to do it again for the final all-in. Oh, thank God you're here. Kate's turn. Having wondered whether she was going to a fancy dress ball as Cleopatra, she quickly discovers she is Cleopatra. But before you go... <laughs> You may touch me for luck. <laughs> and so the rhythm goes. Akmal is the last to go. He probably has the biggest clue from his costume. In this case, another surprise has been added that he won't see until he's on the set. Pinto is a miniature horse. I know he's a miniature horse. I'm a yeah. miniature clown. <laughs> The strike crew have to move quickly now. This all-in requires the three stage areas to be cleared and then reset. They have five minutes to put up an entire breakfast TV show with two live cross areas and ready the helicopter. Oh, yeah, and clean up after the horse. OK? OK? Here. Yeah. Everyone changes in a rush during the break and they assemble backstage except for one. Frank is singled out for the golf buggy. That will take him to the helicopter and his new role as the traffic guy. It often amazes me how quickly they assume the roles we toss them without a second's notice. In this case, Kate jumped at the chance to co-host. We're going to have the results of our phone poll. With our daybreak phone poll this morning yes. asks you... How old you are. <laughs> and you just... SMS in the answer. Excellent. So please and if you get it right, you win a prize. That's great, that's great. Akmal started anchoring a news service he'd never seen. Um, a cat was uh, just taken in the hospital after this tree was broken. And um, I'm sorry, I've, I'm drunk. Angus managed to give us a live cross from a sporting event that even the writers never defined. Not such good news for the young 13-year-old girl from uh, the Gold Coast, Michelle Lau. Uh, she got busted for underage drinking. <laughs> so Sean sure took that. to the snow. This is, uh, this is Mandy Carnava. She is the uh, cross-worldwide ski champion. And uh, good on you, Popper. <laughs> 
And despite being 2,000 feet above the studio, Frank managed to convince anyone watching that he had what it takes to be the traffic guy. But yes, and either there's about 200 cars down there or 400 motorbikes. And with that, the show nears an end. The only thing left is the non-televised part of proceedings, where everyone gathers in the green room and empties the fridge. Trust me, you don't want to see that. Mind you, there's some good bullshitting back there too. Beautifully done.